He is a member of the Department of Anthropology and co-director of the Scripps Center for Marine Archaeology and director of the Center for Cyber Archaeology at the Qualcomm Institute. In helping to launch the SCMA, Levy has emphasized three approaches in his fieldwork in Israel and Greece to explore climate, environmental, and social change in the Eastern Mediterranean, shallow marine geophysics, sediment core analyses, and underwater excavation. Elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Levy is widely published Levantine field archeologist with interest in the role of technology, especially early mining and metallurgy on the evolution of societies, especially in Eastern Mediterranean. Author of 16 books and hundreds of scholarly articles, Professor Levy was recently awarded an honorary doctorate at Charles University in the Czech Republic. Please join me in welcoming now distinguished professor Tom Levy. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Thank okay, you so much. Okay, wonderful. I think everybody's probably pretty zoomed out by now after two years, and I'm... Uh, I'm missing seeing you all in person because I have lectured to Osher a number of times. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So let's see how that works. Um, let me know. Okay. We see it just fine. Great. Fantastic. Let's get the show on the road here. Okay. So, um, you know, I spent uh, 40 years in the deserts of the Holy Land in Israel and Jordan. And after 40 years, it was getting pretty hot. So I decided to cool off with marine archaeology. And what, a, what better place to do that than UC San Diego? And um, about five years ago, the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the main campus launched this, uh, this new center. And uh, I was asked to co-direct it with John Hildebrand, a marine scientist from Scripps. And uh, because I'm a Levantine archeologist, which means uh, the archeology span of Israel, the Jordan, the Palestinian territories, Southern Lebanon, Southern Syria, and the Sinai Peninsula, um, my research drags us into the Eastern Mediterranean. So I've been emphasizing that aspect of the work and I'm really pleased to share with you some of our recent research. In fact, we had two expeditions that just uh, got out of the field in November of 2021. So we got in right before the um, Omicron variant and uh, then we got back home and now things are indeed looking better. And maybe one of these days, you'll all come to Scripps and uh, visit our SCMA uh, laboratory there. It'd be great to uh, host you. So in building this new center, we ask, you know, how do we jumpstart SCMA to become an international player in archaeology today? Well, the answer is really simple. You just dive in. And that's exactly uh, what we did. And this is a photo of um, an excavation by one of our colleagues, Professor Stella Domestica from the University of Cyprus, um, where um, she's uh, excavating a deep water Roman wreck off the south coast of Cyprus. And I was able to visit there and learn with um, Christian McDonald, the chief science diving officer at Scripps, uh, how, how she manages really deep water underwater excavations. But we, we don't do that. We focus on the shallow environment. We focus on the coastal zones of the world because those 
are probably some of the most sensitive areas for um, measuring and monitoring how societies adapt to climate change, environmental change, and social uh, uh, change. So what I like to argue is that archaeology is one of those few fields um, at a university that intersects with every um, division, every academic division on the campus from the medical school and the biological sciences to computer science and engineering, visual arts, the humanities, in my case, the topics of Jewish studies and Greek studies, the social sciences and marine sciences and so on. And, um, and that's, that creates what we could call transdisciplinary research or team research, which really is driving uh, how we do academic uh, scholarly research today and opening up new vistas. So this is a very exciting place to be. And um, in building up uh, the Center for uh, Scripps Center for Marine Archaeology. It's part of UCSD's um, mission that uh, the chancellor uh, helped uh, drive called Understanding and Protecting the Planet. And that allowed us to hire a couple of new young researchers, uh, Isabel Rivera Callazo and Jade Alpine Geddes, who hold joint appointments in anthropology and uh, at, down at Scripps. And the environmental emphasis of their work and our work is helping to um, build our, our center into an, an important contributor. Um, this is a, a, a view of, of our faculty on, on, on the, uh, the upper part of this image. And my colleague, John Hildebrand, who's spoken to you before, he's there on the left. And uh, these are some of our international advisors. I mentioned Stella here and Asaf Yasur Landau, a professor at the University of Haifa. And he's um, a very close collaborator of ours and mine uh, in particular. Well, I mentioned, you know, 40 years in the deserts of the Holy Land. But when I was in, in high school back in uh, 1969, that's when I first started diving. And during COVID, I found my old dive card here from 1969. How many people here remember 1969? Raise, raise your hand. Everybody in this audience. Fantastic. Okay, when I say that to my students, nobody raises their hands, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay, well, SCMA has like a five-prong approach. Our research is driven by historical questions. Uh, we do field work, as I mentioned. My work is in Israel and Greece. Uh, Isabel is working in Puerto Rico, and she and some others uh, are interested in starting some marine archaeology projects in California. We have a, a marine archaeology field school uh, in Israel with the University of Haifa. It, it, uh, it was postponed uh, all over COVID, but the last um, time we were in the field was very successful. We do some research and development, especially developing new ways of uh, recording archaeological sites with uh, photogrammetry. Um, and then uh, a big part of our mission is experiential uh, training of graduate students so that they can help drive the research that uh, we're talking about. Um, this is a, a view of the, the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, down here, and then the terrestrial silk roads up here. And for me, this is a kind of metaphor for where we're kind of driving our research uh, with SCMA. We've already done projects in Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, and uh, Saudi Arabia. We haven't done one in underwater archaeology in the Red Sea, but it's a goal. And we want to make our way to India and all the way to China eventually. Um, a big part of the work 
is uh, scientific diving. And Scripps has the oldest and the best program in the world for this. They uh, have been pioneers in teaching scientific diving. And the goal of that is basically to provide us as research scientists with the tools to make us comfortable working underwater. So this is a hundred hour course and um, it involves about 14 dives. Some of them are off the Scripps Pier. Uh, some of them are on small boats that we also launch off the Scripps Pier. And then there are exams and that was the most difficult thing for me was actually doing a, a written exam after never doing one for 50 years, right? And then, um, but you earn six different uh, qualifications, uh, one of which is from the American Academy of Underwater Science, Sciences to be a scientific diver and various other ones. So it's kind of like getting a miniature PhD. Um, that's a joke, but um, I must say that uh, uh, I, I did I did this when I was 62 years old. So um, I'm not sure I could do it right now, but but back then it it certainly worked. Um, we also have a, a a small boat safety training course at Scripps. So we get all our our students uh, taking that course. This. That, that is uh, Christian McDonald, who I mentioned earlier, the science diving officer here at Scripps. So we, we get a really strong uh, foundation in how to do science diving and handling the small boats we need <clears throat> for our research. This is a picture of our uh, field school in Israel. And this is my colleague, Asaf Yasur Landau. This is Isabel Rivera Callazo, my new uh, colleague. She, she joined us with th her three children. Here's John Hildebrand. Uh, Dick Norris from Scripps was there. Um, we developed a very powerful uh, program. And through the um, Murray Gallinson San Diego Israel Initiative, uh, they kindly provided uh, scholarships for 12 of our students for about uh, $2,500 each to help them participate. So that was great. Um, in 2020, uh, we got a grant from the Coret Foundation uh, in San Francisco to, um, to build this scientific collabor collaborative between our Scripps Center of Marine Archaeology and the University of Haifa in Israel. And Haifa is, is great because they're pioneers in underwater excavation. They've been doing it for over 50 years and developed all the techniques. And so we can learn a lot from them and we can bring the whole battery of marine science and uh, scientific visualization that we that we have at UCSD to them and together, we're really helping to build up uh, the University of Haifa program and our, and our own. So this is a great uh, collaboration. We focus on three ap approaches, as was mentioned earlier, uh, applying marine, shallow marine geophysics, um, underwater and terrestrial sediment coring, um, to get proxy data that tells us about the ancient environments. And I'll explain that in a little bit. And then we do photogrammetry, which is where we take uh, a whole battery of um, high definition photographs and we can process them into uh, geospatial models and get beautiful maps uh, and of high, accuracy, and then we do underwater excavation. Um, our approach to, um, to data collection, it follows what, um, what, what my team developed at the Qualcomm Institute that I call cyber archaeology, which is the marriage of computer science, engineering, the natural sciences, and archaeology for data acquisition that we see in this upper left part of the um, pie chart. 
and this uh, when we bring this underwater, the cyber archaeology, that means doing uh, side scan sonar, uh, this is the geophysics, uh, sub bottom profiling, multi beam, um, sediment coring, as we mentioned, the excavation and the photogrammetry. All of this produces digital data. And then we have to curate that data. So we develop programs uh, to, to do that, special databases. And ultimately, we look to the UCSD library, the Geisel Library, as the place where we put the digital uh, collections. Um, and then we do the analyses of the data using geographic information systems, uh, different kinds of radiometric dating, and so on. And then it's all about the dissemination of the data. And that, of course, goes with traditional peer-reviewed publications. But also, we, do, we use online methods, like we've developed a digital archaeology atlas of the Holy Land. And then we have 3D uh, visualization, virtual reality, where we use um, uh, personal VR devices uh, like Google Cardboard. And then we have large scale 3D platforms, which I, I'll invite you to, um, to the Qualcomm Institute to see some of those developed by um, uh, Professor Tom DeFonti and others. Uh, where you can share a virtual reality experience with like 10 other people. And it's very, it's very profound. But it's really the um, historical questions, the anthropological questions that drive our research. So we have, uh, for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean around 1200 BC, there was a collapse of civilizations. All the major civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean, including the Mycenaean Greeks, the Hittites, New Kingdom Egypt, they all collapsed. And we don't know exactly why. Uh, there are a variety of theories. Some of them are environmental change. Some of have suggested pandemics, warfare, uh, new methods of transportation, and so on. Um, and this is highlighted in a popular book by a friend of mine by the name of Eric Klein, who narrowed it down to 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed. But what's of interest to us here is that after that late Bronze Age collapse of civilizations around 1200 BC, um, there was a power vacuum. And um, that power vacuum was filled by many small kingdoms or polities around the Eastern Mediterranean. And in our part of the world, that would be the ancient Israelites, the Philistines, uh, the Moabites, the Midianites, um, and the Phoenicians, for example. So this is, uh, this is what this power vacuum opened up a lot of uh, new opportunities for people that we should keep in mind. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work on the Carmel coast of Israel. Um, it focuses on a place called Tel Dor. It's about 20 kilometers south of the city of Haifa on the Mediterranean coast. It's been excavated for many years by the Hebrew University and the other, the University of Haifa and others. And um, after that late Bronze Age collapse, we have what's called the Iron Age, which lasts from 1200 to 586 BC. That is, uh, why 586? Because that's when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. But around 1000 BC, uh, King Solomon uh, included this area of Dor as one of the 12 administrative districts of his kingdom. So this place is loaded with history. And um, with uh, Professor Asaf Yasur Landau, we've been exploring the submerged aspect of this area 
around Tell Door. And it's a, it's a gem for um, understanding the local processes of uh, how peoples responded to that collapse of civilization that I mentioned. Um, now in my desert work, uh, a big project I did was in Jordan, in the Southern deserts of Jordan, not far from the famous uh, site of Petra, but Petra is up in the highlands of uh, ancient Edom. This is where the uh, biblical kingdom of Edom was located. In the lowlands of Edom is an area called Fainan, which is the copper ore resource uh, zone. And some people suggest that this is where Solomon's mines were. But what I'm showing you here, contemporary to Tel Dor that we just looked at in the Iron Age, is a huge copper production site called Chibat Nahas in Arabic, which in English, it means the ruins of copper. And all that black stuff that you see on the site surface here is the remains of copper slag from ancient smelting where the ore was crushed, heated up, and the copper metal was extracted. And uh, up here, you can see a, a large uh, Iron Age fortress. This site is about 25 acres in size. It's absolutely incredible. And um, we've been studying the role of ancient technology in the evolution of both the Edomite kingdom and the Israelite kingdom. So, uh, but the big question was always, where did the copper go? And um, that has been uh, answered in part by underwater archeology. span And here you can see my colleague, Dr. Udi Galili. He's uh, one of those pioneer um, marine archeologists. In his explorations north of Tel Dor, around 10 kilometers north at a place called Neve Yam, uh, he found a shipwreck with um, over 70 copper ingots. Um, they're, they're kind of like bun shaped and you see them here on the seafloor and Udi is recording them and then putting them in this basket to raise it to the surface. Well, when they did lead isotope analyses to trace the uh, chemical fingerprint, if you like, of the, of the copper, it turns out they came from Southern Jordan and it looks like Chirbet and Nahas. So the, the, the copper ingots would have been traded across the Southern desert of Israel and then up the coast to different ports and then made its way around the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, this one was uh, for whatever reasons, probably a, a storm this ship uh, sunk and we're lucky enough to find the copper ingots. Um, we've done excavations in the underwater in the, in the bay of Tel Dor. And this just gives you a view of what one of those uh, excavations looked like. This is part of a structure, maybe a tower from a port dating to the Hellenistic times. And that means about 333 BC to about 100 BC, something like that. And um, underneath this uh, structure, we found a lot of evidence of um, Neolithic occupation uh, from the end of the Neolithic period, what we call the Pottery Neolithic. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Here is uh, the excavation of that area at, at, in the waters of Tel Dor. And here are, here's an example of some of the Neolithic pottery we found, some arrowheads. And this is, this is the, the, what we call the South Bay of Tel Dor. And up here is the actual site that we looked at uh, earlier. But this would have been an enclosed bay and the question is, what did it look like in the Iron Age? Was it bigger? Was it smaller? 
And these are the building remains that we found underwater of part of the Neolithic uh, village there. This is a map um, showing you the distribution of Neolithic sites. Uh, most of them are submerged uh, along the coast of Israel, um, south of Haifa and north of a place called Atlitir. Tel Dor is located down here somewhere. Um, you can see that these sites are mostly from the end of the Neolithic, the Pottery Neolithic, that is around 6,000 to 4,500 BC. That's what PN means. So this is Pottery Neolithic. There's only one earlier Neolithic site, which we refer to as the pre-Pottery Neolithic, and that's at a place called Atlit Yam. And um, here you can see uh, Udi Galili recording the excavation of a well that's under about six meters of water today. So at the beginning of the Neolithic, the pre-pottery Neolithic, let's say around 8,000 uh, BC, um, there was an open air village and over the last um, 8,000 years, sea level rise has gone up around six meters in this area. Um, but the very beginnings of the Neolithic period, what we, if th this is called pre-pottery Neolithic C, and then there's a, a B period and even a pre-pottery Neolithic A that goes back to about 10,000 BC, th they're all missing here. Why? That's a, that's a big question. Why is the beginning of the Neolithic period not represented here on the Carmel coast? There's a mountain range here called Mount Carmel that goes from Haifa uh, all the way down about 25 uh, kilometers to the south, and to the west is a, is a coastal plain. And um, so this whole area is part of our uh, research uh, area. Um, well, we love mud. That is, we love sediment um, because it provides us with the clues and the data concerning the ancient environment where sites are located. So in this picture, this is me with my colleague, Professor Dick Norris who's a uh, paleobiologist from Scripps. And Dick is really the expert on sediment coring um, for many of us at, uh, at Scripps. And he's, he's my most active field collaborator um, on these different expeditions that I'm speaking about today. Well, when you get a core, a sediment core, it can be around um, 10 centimeters in diameter and six meters long, or it could be five centimeters in diameter. And then you find different layers within those sediment cores. And we date those layers with radiocarbon dating or other methods like uh, OSL, optical stimulated luminescence dating. But inside the cores embedded in the sediment, we can find proxy data uh, to help us reconstruct the ancient ecosystem. So we can find um, fish bones, we can find fragments of sponges, algae, corals, or microscopic foraminifera or bivalves and sea urchin fragments. So that helps us reconstruct the ecosystem. If we wanna understand the environmental history of these areas, then we wanna look at the actual sediments and the grain size of the sediments and what they reflect in terms of how those sediments were laid down in in and around the ancient archeological sites. And so the sedimentological data enables us to understand the origin, the environmental processes and the human influences on the environmental histories 
of the different regions we work. So the cores are like an environment, a paleo environmental archive, if you like, for uh, the past. And here you can see the Carmel Coast over here. At the northern end is the, um, of the Carmel Range is the Taboon Cave. And at the southern end is the Kabara Cave. These are some of the most important cave, um, sites for understanding the origins of modern humans in uh, the Middle East uh, and in the old world, in fact. And so Israel is actually a core area for understanding the evolution of anatomically modern humans. Another hearth area for this is Southwest France. So um, here I've just highlighted some of the main sites Tel Dor, the Kabara Cave over here, and then the underwater site with, at Atlit with Udi Galili. In Israel, we get these core, the terrestrial cores uh, using this um, gasoline powered uh, pressure system called the geoprobe. And we, we sort of feed in plastic sleeves encased in a, um, in a uh, aluminum uh, pipe and push it down into the ground. And we keep extracting uh, uh, the, the sequence of sediments and we can collect up to 20 meters of sediment. And here around the South Bay of Door, you can see where we sampled. And um, at the end of the day, this is what they look like. These cores, we pack them up and then we air freight them in a nice uh, wooden box to UCSD. And we start to analyze them at our SCMA sediment core at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So over here, you can see a photograph of what one of these cores looks like. And you can see the different sediments, different colors of sediments that we relate to different environmental uh, settings in which these sediments accumulated. And there's a huge anomaly right here. You can see where that anomaly, like this is a, a, a dark silty clay that represents like a swampland, but smack in the middle of it here is a, uh, we found bivalves like seashells. And actually at the time, the um, and this is um, dated to the be very beginning of the Neolithic period around 10,000 uh, BC. We find um, that the seashore was around six kilometers further west than it is today. And yet um, these seashells were accumulating at Tel Dor, uh, which along the coast here um, in, a, in a very dry environment. How did they get there? Well, we think there was a tsunami and I'm gonna show you um, a quick video of how that happened. But before that, I wanna just give you the clue to how we think the tsunami was formed. We believe that because like Southern California, um, Israel is a very, tectonically active area. You know, you have the, um, the Dead Sea uh, and Rift Valley uh, to, to the uh, east of the coast of Israel. And that's part of the African Rift system where you have like two plates, the African and the Asian plates moving a lot. It's very tectonically active. And then there are different valleys that go east-west, uh, more or less across Israel. And so when you have a big earthquake in the Jordan Valley, it can trigger other earthquakes that reach the coast. And uh, our geoscientists believe that this was the trigger that caused uh, big landslides that um, caused uh, many cubic kilometers of sediment to just collapse in a landslide along the coast here. So you have 
the door landslide over here. You have the Goliath landslide over here. And when these things went down, they created a tsunami wave. And that's what we're going to look at. So now let's see if this works. And bear with me because you're going to have a quick uh, commercial in here. Let's Friends see. would walk up to me and Oops, just be like, I didn't write that. Just a minute, folks. Yeah, I'll just tell them. It's okay, mine. here we go. Can you see that? Yes. When the Scripps Center of Marine Archaeology wanted to kickstart actually excavating underwater, we started our collaboration with the University of Haifa uh, and the Reconati Center of Maritime Studies under uh, Professor Asaf Yasur Landau. And Asaf suggested that we begin our work together at Tel Dor in the waters of Tel Dor, which was one of the most important ancient ports in antiquity. So that was our, our that's our long-term research focus. And it's there that we decided we wanted to really expand our understanding of the paleo environment. So that's when we decided to bring Gilad Steinberg into the story and Gilad it's been so great working with you. And when we started to get the cores in this area, we worked very close to the shoreline of, uh, of the South Bay of the ancient port of Dor. There are a number of small bays there. And the South Bay, we can see uh, to my left, it's in big letters, South Bay. Could you say something about the strategy we use to core in this area? Yeah, so in the South Bay of Dor, we used uh, the Gale Probe, which is basically the coring rig that we mostly use in the coastal plain of Israel that I used through my um, my my uh, PhD research. Um, and this, this coring methodology lets us retrieve continuous um, core records of the stratigraphy of the area. Um, and this, uh, this is such a good methodology to use just because using this core methodology, we can understand the environment and the, the changes that influence leading to its current morphology. So we got uh, a number of cores indicated there, D4, D12, D6. One of those had a big surprise for us. Which one did this start to reveal? Which core started to reveal the surprise? Well, we, uh, we conducted this coring over two uh, coring, uh, two coring expedition. In 2018, we retrieved core D4. And in D4, after extracting this core out from the surface, I was, I was very surprised to see uh, this very thin sand unit. Well, well, let's look at it. Hang on. Can we have the next slide, please? Let's, let's look at it. Okay. So I remember that day I came into the lab at Scripps, you know, overlooking the beautiful Pacific Ocean. It can't be a better place to work. And uh, there was Gilad. And then in walked uh, Professor Norris in his white lab coat. And uh, you guys were all excited. Can you point out what that layer was that you, go ahead, show me where, wh which one it was again. So it's it's uh, it's it's the lithological unit um, uh, called F3. You can actually see it between two black layers. Got it. Got it. F3. Okay, Dick. What 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 got you guys so excited about F3? Yeah. What so what we were doing was we were cutting open these cores, these tubes of sediment, uh, with a saw, and each one started to show the same kind of thing. You know, this layer of sand uh, in between. Uh, darker colored um, sediments that we thought represented wetlands. And then the really cool thing about that was that the sand layer contained shells, uh, marine shells. Now, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not talking, we're on land. You're not talking about like land snails. You're talking about like mollusks, right? Yeah, marine shells and little pieces of clay and stuff like that that just didn't look like a normal uh, deposit. And what was so interesting about it was that core after core, when we split them open, we all see it, saw very similar kinds of 
of layers like this, which was, was not what we expected. Based on these data, there's no question that we identified an ancient tsunami event in the core record from DOOR. So the key uh, variables are what the water depth is, uh, how big a submarine slide has been generated when the, when the earthquake strikes, uh, you know, how much of the, of the continental uh, slope failed, basically. Um, that creates a displacement, which is what you see in that big wave. Uh, and then there's the issue of also how far from the coast you know, the, uh, the uh, submarine slide happens because that determines how rapidly the wave will reach the land surface. And you can see in the model that the, the wave is overwashing the coastline uh, and is uh, presumably you know, decimating any uh, coastal communities that might have been there. I think another cool thing you can see in the simulation is the orange area. So that was the area that got inundated by the, by the tsunami wave. And it's not really uniform along the coastline. You know, it, uh, so the area immediately opposite the slope failure really gets hit. And then a little bit farther north as well, you know, up closer to uh, the town of Haifa. So we nailed the age of this tsunami deposit to 7,900. 7,300 BC. And we did this using a relatively new innovative technique called optically stimulated luminescence dating. OSL dating dates the last time that sand grains were exposed to light. So we were able to subsample the cores in the dark and then bring them to my lab at Utah State University to determine how old they were. Yeah, so we're thinking that these marine shells were transported over a distance of 16 kilometers. 16 kilometers, that's like, yeah, four, four or five miles, right? Off co so Israel was bigger in those, in those days. Yeah, during these times, the, shore, uh, um, the, the sea level was much lower. So the coastal plain was much, much wider. We are now at the Nachal Oren, Neolithic settlement. Uh, this is a pre-pottery Neolithic A and the B settlement, very large one, probably the largest in the area of the Carmel. When the tsunami was hitting the coast, it could have had a very, very strong effect on this early Mediterranean economy, impacting the fields, impacting the livestock, causing perhaps an irreparable damage that took much time to recover from. This is an event during a time in which society was beginning to form a sedentary society and village life was in its very beginning. We can only imagine what consequences this event or this mega event had on the belief system of the people that resided here. Um, are you guys with me still? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Let me just get this uh, PowerPoint back and we'll, um, we're going to close the, the lecture with some highlights from our research in Greece. Uh, it takes place in a place called Methoni, which is um, in the Peloponnese, the Peloponnesos region of Greece down here. And it is the westernmost uh, peninsula of the southern uh, Peloponnese. It's called Messenia in general. And this research is carried out in collaboration with Professor George Papadiatoru and Professor Maria Garaga from the University of Patras. And they are. Um, experts in shallow marine geophysics, and they uh, help us lead the way in melding these approaches to underwater uh, archaeology. Here's a picture of uh, in this past October, uh, October 2021 is still um, pandemic time, so it's really a pain to travel, as you all know. And he, this is exactly why my wife, Alina, doesn't want to go on these kind of trips, because you can see we have to schlep like a thousand pounds worth of equipment 
And these are my graduate students, uh, Lauren Clark, Tony Tamburino, and Jack Reese here. Um, um, a little earlier than the late Bronze Age in the Eastern Mediterranean, at the end of the early Bronze Age, around 2200 to 1900 BC, um, scientists believed that there was a mega drought at that time. And I've highlighted here with regard to the chronologies of the, of the, uh, re of the Aegean region. And um, that's one of the questions we wanna understand was how would this mega drought have impacted human settlement in what we call the Middle Bronze Age or the Middle Helladic period in this uh, region. Again, we're going to apply marine geophysics, sediment coring, and photogrammetry. We haven't yet got permission to do the actual underwater excavations in Greece, but we're working towards it. And what I'm telling you today is really a summary of two seasons of field work, one in 2019 and another one in 2021. And um, this is just a graph that kind of pulls together um, how we use uh, different um, marine geophysical instruments and uh, the photogrammetry, the underwater photography for mapping and so on. And we pull it all together into a geographic information system, a kind of um, uh, collection area for all our data so that we can analyze it in 3D and in its environmental context. So this is a, a drone shot of Methoni. And what we're looking at here on the left is a really uh, beautiful Venetian period uh, fortress that is from about um, 12, uh, well, let's say 1400 to 1700 AD. But what's of great interest to us is in the seafloor of the Methoni Bay, okay? And all of this that you see, this dark area that you see here is actually part of a submerged um, site dating to the middle Helladic period. That is from about 2000 to 1500 BC. And here you can see our boat, our little yacht that we rent. It's called the um, Me Lady Me Lord. My Lady, Me Lord, <laughs> that's kind of a funny name, but that's, that's what it's called. And the University of Patras rents that out. They don't have their own vessel, but then they can outfit it with all the geophysical state-of-the-art equipment that they need. Um, here's an, uh, a Google Earth view of the Methoni Bay, and here's the Venetian fortress over here. This is the submerged Middle Bronze Age site. And then there are a couple of well-known shipwrecks over here from the Roman period that I'm going to show you. And also there's this little island, islet called Nisia Kuli. And on that are Middle Bronze Age remains. And as you can see, if this is 500 meters, this island is about one kilometer southeast of the middle Helladic site, submerged site. And yet on top of this little island is middle Helladic remains, including an altar. So the question is, did the site extend all the way over here? And if it did, this site where we can see about three and a half hectares of, of the site on the submerged surface, it was much bigger than what we actually see today. So let's see how that works. Well, what's it like on the boat? When the geophysicists are doing their work, I'm cooking or my team is cooking. And when we're doing the underwater surveying and so on, our Greek friends do the cooking and we eat really well. And so here, here you can see my colleague, George Papadiotoro and some of the students here. And uh, this is Demetrius, uh, 
who's the, uh, he, he's a PhD and uh, data processor. This is Maria, uh, Professor Maria Garaga, looking at real time uh, sub bottom profile data here, which tells us about the different layers of sediment underneath the seafloor. So up here is sand, and we wanna know what's the nature of the sediments below the sand here. Here are two of the grad students from Greece um, putting a tide logger uh, along the wharf here at Methoni where we work enable, so that they can calibrate their uh, measurements that they do with the marine geophysics with regard to the movement of the waves. So they get this way, they ensure that we get the highest quality data. And this just gives you a feel for what it's like doing work uh, every morning, you know, leaving the little dock. I mean, it can't be better. I mean, now you understand why after 40 years in the desert, you would wanna be uh, in Greece, uh, enjoying the coastal area the octopus and the um, ouzo. Um, here you can see my grad students, Tony Tamburino and Lauren Clark assembling this um, underwater photography rig, which includes three um, high definition cameras uh, connected to a, um, a mechanism that, uh, uh, that enables them to all fire at the same time. And this is another of the Scripps uh, sci science diving officers, Rich Walsh. And Christian or Rich always go with us on these expeditions to ensure that we have the highest quality um, safety and most efficient diving. Um, here you can just get a feel for how many kilometers of data we collected um, with these different track lines, like here over 16 kilometers of multi-beam, here you have over five kilometers of side scan sonar, 15 kilometers of sub-bottom profile data, and so on. And um, here, you beneath these track lines, we actually have a nice map almost a photo mosaic, but it's made of side scan sonar data to show us what, what the features are on the, exposed on the seafloor. And um, here you can see that uh, image in more detail. And uh, this is a, um, a detailed view of the side scan sonar data where the archeological site is sitting on top of this hard, kind of substrate. And uh, we can trace that throughout uh, the, the area of um, the bay at Methoni. Um, here we've thrown a grid 25 meters by 25 meters over the area of submerged interests. And all these dark uh, sp uh, spots that you see here are the submerged archeological remains from the middle Helladic period. And if you add them all up, they equal about 3.5 hectares, which is around eight acres of visible archeological remains. And then we took our uh, camera rig and we put it on a, um, a underwater scooter called a piranha. And we drove it over these squares and uh, 25 by 25 meter squares to map in high definition the archaeological remains found on the seafloor. The multi-beam data gives us a nice kind of bathymetric or submerged topographic map of the site. And so this, this up here is around four meters uh, below the water surface. And then when we get down here, it's about six to seven meters below the surface. So the, the site is like on a, slow, a slight slope. The big question is why is it 
um, why is the site submerged today under that much water, four to seven meters? Um, here, another view of, uh, of our working environment. There's a fisherman getting onto his little traditional kaiki boat, and we can hear the beautiful Greek uh, rembetica music and see the um, Phoenician fortress in the background at Mathoni just to give you a feel for it. Here are five of those uh, 25 by 25 meter grids that we want to look at. Now, based on the geophysical uh, results, we wanted to test um, where the juicy spots were. And so our geophysics team from Patras gave us six targets to look at. That's what this is T1, T2, T3, T4. Based on the geophysics, they suggested those would be the places we should dive on and investigate and see what we can see. And so that's what we're gonna look at here. Here's Rich at dive site number four, and he's saying, this is the area. Rich does the navigating. I follow him and then I can get to the spot and do my archeology. span And that makes it very efficient. And this is me with the piranha. And now we're going down and we're gonna investigate um, some of the architectural remains in about five meters uh, uh, depth of water. So there's the seafloor. You can see a beautiful stone line circle there. It's almost a meter in width and over six meters wide. So this could be the foundation of a tomb or it could be the uh, foundation of a, a grain storage silo of some kind. We don't know, it requires excavation. The site was first found in 1985 by my colleague Elias Spondilis. Uh, from the uh, Greek effort of underwater archaeology. And there you can see um, the, the, the circle in more detail here. And then let me just show you briefly how we do the photography. This uh, system was originally developed by Stuart Sandin's lab. He's a coral specialist at Scripps. And back in 2019, he kindly lent us the system. And since then, we've developed our own with some different kinds of cameras and a different kind of intervalometer to fire all the cameras at the same time. And this is Tony Tamburino, my graduate student, uh, running the system over one of those um, squares of, of interest in the submerged site. All of those rocks you see there are the remains of, of destroyed walls or eroded walls that somebody built um, around 4,000 years ago. That's what one of the, the squares looks like, uh, 25 by 25 meter squares in 3D with uh, the tape measures. We use old fashioned tape measures to lay out these squares. And there you can see the stone line circle we were diving on. And we can use these geospatial, um, geo-referenced maps to, uh, or images to create maps of the archeological site. And in the old days, this required somebody with a pencil and a paper, either on land or underwater to draw each stone. Now we can do it on our computer. And there's the circle in relation to the 25 by 25 meter grid. And then in the comfort of our labs or our hotel room, we can draw the in, in uh, more thoughtfully all the stone line features that are uh, we recorded in the field. And this is something you can't do on one tank of, uh, of air. And so, Again, this is the advantage of these kinds of mapping techniques. So that's the that's two of the uh, survey squares down here with the 
stone line circle and what might be a road here. And then over a hundred meters, that's over 300 feet to the Northeast, more architecture seen on these dark splotches that I showed you with that, um, the Google Earth imagery and also from our drones. So the area is just loaded with architecture below four to six meters of water. And then if we use the um, sides, the uh, sub bottom profiler, we can get like cross sections of what the different layers of sediment look like underneath the sand layer here. And what's interesting here is that, you know, the stone line circle I showed you and the other architecture would be represented here, but we can see that this same kind of material and layer goes underneath the sand layer here for many, many hundreds of meters, as we'll see in a moment. So this area that's hash marked, this is the area that we can see on Google Earth of the submerged architecture, okay? That's 3.5 hectares of, um, of art architecture. But with the sub-bottom profiler, we can extend that and we can see it goes for almost 16 hectares or more than 40 acres of area is under this under the waves here so this is uh this is a huge site and we were beginning to wonder if it was actually a village or a town of some kind so i'm going to close with just showing you some of the shipwrecks that were originally recorded by one of the um, pioneers of um, underwater archaeology peter Throckmorton back in 1962. He went to Methoni, and just south of Methoni is an island called Sapienza, and he identified, well, he didn't, it was some Greek uh, sponge divers found the um, these two wrecks that I'm going to show you. And here we are, that's me and Tony, and Rich is leading the way up there. And we're headed for what's called the column wreck. So these are uh, a series of maybe 18 fragments of huge uh, granite columns uh, from the Roman period. And scholars think they may have originated actually in Israel at a place called Caesarea, loaded on a boat, shipped to another region in the Roman Empire. And then uh, it went down in a storm off the north coast of Sapienza Island. And um, Throckmorton used uh, the old fashioned, you know, tape measure, uh, waterproof paper and pencil to measure these columns. And he made quite a good map. And we checked his measurements to our geo-referenced um, imagery that was recorded with a um, what we call an RTK GPS system to ensure about two millimeters of accuracy. And um, believe it or not, his, his work, the measurements are spot on. They're excellent. But um, it's difficult to estimate the actual um, volume uh, of these uh, columns. Uh, without doing it with the 3D system that we use. And also uh, he missed a couple of fragments just because they couldn't, they couldn't cover the whole area like we could in uh, using the scooter system that I showed you. So here you can see uh, uh, with our geo-referenced um, high definition, 3D modeling underwater every single column and every fragment from the wreck that um, this is in about 25 to 30 feet of water. Um, and that's a 3D view of uh, the columns with our photogrammetry system. And then let's look at the next site, which is called the, sar the sarcophagus site. And here we are swimming over a fragment of a giant stone line 
um, receptacle for human remains. And here's what they look like. Um, these were unfinished, again, from the Roman period, uh, probably around 100 AD, something like that. These were um, on their way uh, probably to, um, to Rome, and they have unfinished design motifs. So these would have been brought to the mortuary context in Rome or another part of the empire. And then they would um, carve these out in more detail and actually put an inscription of the person who was uh, buried in the sarcophagus. Uh, and that's just a 3D um, view of the collection of the submerged sarcophagi. So, um, I'll just quickly show you the kind of coring we did underwater as part of our research in Methoni. Um, this we had some really rough days where we couldn't even go out in the in the water because of uh, storms. Uh, in 2019, the weather was great. Um, here you can see <clears throat> our survey area. Now you're familiar with it, <clears throat> and here we've superimposed a map uh, by a, an Italian uh, cartographer named Vincenzo Maria from 1708 of the um, Venetian uh, fortress over here, just to orient you. And then this is uh, another map from some, uh, the University of Minnesota researchers back in the 1970s they didn't do any underwater work, but they did some uh, terrestrial sediment coring uh, over in these areas to map the uh, paleo environment on land. Now we can start to pull the land and the sea data together. And here are the coring locations that we picked in relation to the site. We didn't actually core on the site, but uh, near it. And we, we determine where we should uh, core based on the sub-bottom profiles that George and Maria's team provided. And here you can see um, Rich and Tony um, moving the collar of our sediment coring device, which is like a, uh, a pile driver. It was, this was developed by Dick Norris and they're moving it up um, so that we can hammer that thing down another meter into the seafloor. And um, let's see, here's one of Lauren and myself where we're actually uh, hammering the core into the seafloor. So th this is how what we do. This is what the work is like. And then, uh, we have to, two people have to work very hard to extract the core out of the uh, sea floor. And then once it's out, uh, we, we lay it out on the deck and, uh, and we let it dry. And then we cut it into segments that can be shipped to UC San Diego. And that's where uh, we pull all the the digital data together at the Qualcomm Institute. And I'll just close saying I love this mission statement of uh, the Qualcomm Institute, inventing a persistent collaborative research and education environment as a model for the major research university in the 21st century. And that's what we try to do at UCSD and um, it's really great to be uh, a part of that. So I'll leave it at that. And if we have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. Professor Levy, that was a fabulous presentation. So interesting. I couldn't help but thinking uh, when we were watching this, if a thousand years from now, um, other research groups will be exploring the depths of the ancient civilization of Miami. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think yeah. so. I, I yeah. think, uh, I mean, look, it could have been New Orleans. Um, in some respects, uh, we, 
if if they didn't do reconstruction work out after Katrina, um, that a bit big parts of of New Orleans would have been um, just underwater for the next generation to look at. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Open it up to members. Are there any questions from members? I think you wowed us all. <laughs> okay. Well, it's I, I know people are getting burned out on Zoom uh, presentations. So, um, you know, it's been great to be with you and uh, maybe Thank you at, very much. at some point we'll organize a tour, a tour of our facility at Scripps. Wonderful. Well, we thank you very, very much for this really enlightening presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye.